Our next speaker is Lyndall Plant from, uh, from Brisbane, PhD student at the moment at the University of Queensland. Lyndall's had a long and uh, illustrious career working in local government and um, tree management and urban forest policy and planning. I was had a happy time for some time. Lyndall and I worked in the same department in Brisbane. Lyndall's also been a past president of the International Society of Arboriculture Australian Chapter. She's been a Churchill Fellow and she's a passionate advocate of trees for people. Lyndall's topic this morning is justifying investments in leafy streets of today and tomorrow, the business case based on property value benefits. Please welcome Lyndall. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely to see so many people here this morning. Um, thank you also very much to the um, Victorian Garden History Society for the invitation. I had the pleasure last night of meeting many of the committee members, um, putting together such great events uh, like the Tree Forum today and other things. Um, I, I think it's also great to be um, sharing a growing body of homegrown um, research and knowledge uh, and experience. Uh, from people like um, Greg and the other people that you'll hear from today. Um, th this homegrown research is, is so important because, as you've already heard, um, trees and cities are facing some, some very um, real and very serious challenges. Leafy streetscapes, uh, an integral part of livable and resilient cities, and I personally believe that it's time to make a much stronger business case for investing in them today and tomorrow. I'm particularly passionate about street trees. I think in terms of the battlefield that um, Greg has set the scene for, um, these are the trees on the front line of our urban forest. Uh, they're subject to a, a wide range of impacts, as we've, we've already heard that they're living in a very changing, probably the most changing, and delicate environment. They're competing for space, as we've already heard, and I think they're also competing for attention, uh, the right kind of positive attention. Uh, somehow they're too easily taken for granted, um, even though street trees in particular are those that we live closest to, uh, and they're offering us benefits 24-7. My research is uh, focused on just one of the benefits of street trees, and there are many, many others. Uh, and leafy streetscapes, and that's property value benefits. And the approach I've taken is very deliberately about making a stronger business case for investment by local government authorities and perhaps other investors, because we need alternate investors. I think the, the burden can't be entirely met, or won't be entirely met by local government authorities. So we need to add economics, as you've already heard, uh, to the tactical toolkit, and I think you'll hear later on also from um, Roger about um, some economic arguments as well. So in, we're trying to grab more attention, um, positive attention for these trees on the front line, uh, and yet also my research just uh, also uh, provides a, a little bit of an insight into some of the attitudes of home buyers in particular um, to these trees. So unlike other forests, um, street trees require the most careful selection, the most careful installation, the most careful nurturing, um, and, and a long-term kind of maintenance um, burden, I, I guess you could say, or, or um, lots, of, lots of maintenance. And this, this is an expense. Um, street trees are perhaps the most expensive to install, to, in, to establish and, and maintain. Uh, and these days, street trees Pretty much all of them require a level of traffic management just to access them, uh, to maintain or to access those areas to, to install. Um, and sometimes uh, in inner city areas, um, some of those trees can only be accessed even with traffic management you know, between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m. Um, so there's a lot of competition for, um, uh, for funds, it's a, it's a very ex expensive exercise and there's co competition also for uh, community support. And even in a, in a very um, leafy uh, city like, um, oh, like Brisbane, I think what happens there is that a lot of people just take 
those street trees and other leafiness uh, for granted. Um, and, until, of course, the budget bid gets put on the table of the local government authority. What? $13 million a year to plant and maintain street trees? You've got to be joking. You know, we need some money for waste management, for road management, you know, for other social services that are you know, top of our list in local government. Um, so street trees require that stronger voice at the budget table. And um, I think on the other hand also, funding agencies deserve to know what kind of return they're getting for the investment that they're making. So just to summarise that intro, um, sustaining urban forest components like street trees require an active management. That means they require a lot of attention. Um, that is expensive. The competition for support as well as funds is tough. And um, quantifying or measuring and valuing some of those benefits and the costs can help build some better recognition and stronger business cases for investment. So what I want to do in my presentation over the next 20 minutes or so is um, outline uh, a little bit of a historical perspective of Brisbane's urban forest, first of all, but also to, to lead into the, you know, that changing and challenging uh, role of street trees in Brisbane, and I don't think that it would be uncommon for those sorts of changes and challenges to be going on in, in other cities. I'll then describe the um, benefit cost analysis that um, I've undertaken, which uh, um, you know, not wanting to, to leave the, um, the results until the very end, but it, it showed very clearly that street trees are well and truly paying their way in property value benefits alone uh, and providing measurable returns to those uh, beneficiaries and investors. Um, I'll also um, provide a bit, few learnings and, and some cautions about those uh, results as well um, and how that fits with this toolkit or this evidence base for, that we need for sustainable urban forest management. And I guess the key message is that we, we need help from, from residents, uh, from decision makers, from um, groups like yourselves um, if, and funding agencies. That everyone needs to recognise some of these measurable dollar benefits that urban trees have and make the case, uh, make the case for, and advocate for their support. So what does history tell us about what's going on in Brisbane? Well, we've grown a lot greener in the last 60 years from the days when um, Brisbane was called Century Box City. Um, the Century Box was the, the outdoor dunny in, in the backyard before sewerage was reticulated. Um, that was the toilet. Uh, and you couldn't have much vegetation in the backyard because, you know, you need to get down there you know, lions and tigers and other critters free, um, day or night. Um, but it provided some, some space for, for greening later on. And of course, before curbin channeling came along, you know, curbin channeling was just making it along its way out into the suburbs of, of Brisbane and sealed roads, um, was reaching suburbia. Um, street tree planting, I think, was, was waiting for a bit more formalised um, curbside waste collection uh, as well. So not many street trees there at that stage. But we've sort of, in Brisbane's urban forest, has cycled through um, a range of, of greening episodes. Cycled through, all right, from the much earlier times when we had this sort of verdant, you know, riverine rainforest um, throughout many parts of, of Brisbane, uh, dwarfing the early settlers. That's the, you know, uh, this is about an 1830s, 40, apparently, photo. Yeah, and, and that's a person standing next to a prop root of a fig tree there. Um, and perhaps this is allegedly you know, um, a fig tree in the suburb now called Fig Tree Pocket. Obviously that fig tree is no longer there, but the suburb took its name from uh, fig trees like this. Oop. Uh, I think we go one back. Sorry, skipped ahead there a bit. Yeah. So this subtropical greenness that we enjoy and what um, residents of Brisbane and visitors to Brisbane say that um, they enjoy about you know, subtropical Brisbane now actually grew up around you know, that sort of timber and tin single dwelling you know, um, structures with, 
where there was lots of space in the backyard and there was some space on the streetscape waiting, waiting to be greened. And so now we've got this sort of attractive um, greenness that perhaps um, people are, are taking for granted. And residents also say that they um, value the leafy streetscapes uh, wh where they are. Um, and of course you could imagine that the, the comfort and cooling that comes from walking down a leafy streetscape is a hell of a lot better than waiting for the bus as these poor school kids are, you know, back in the 50s and, and 60s. So we, we, we know a lot about um, Brisbane's urban forest cover um, already. Um, we're in fact um, undertaking a, a new assessment of tree cover across Brisbane based on satellite imagery and um, airborne LIDAR uh, in, in 2000, from 2014, so those results will be available soon. Um, but these are the results from 2010, so not like so long ago. Uh, we, we already know that um, because uh, Brisbane City Council area in particular covers no less than 13,000 square kilometres, unlike the compact uh, City Council areas of, of say Sydney and Melbourne, um, that we have around 51% uh, of that land area has some tree cover. So that's a, a pretty impressive um, tree cover, but uh, obviously a, a lot of that uh, in the city-wide scene is on um, public land, um, predominantly in fringing forests, um, fringing public forests. Um, so it's about 50-50 maybe public to private land tree cover in, in Brisbane in 2010. Um, but when we get into the residential suburbs, um, there's, a, there's a different story. We've still got about two thirds of tree cover on private property in, um, in Brisbane in residential areas. Um, and obviously the balance is on public land, particularly in parks, um, but also in the road reserve. I think it's therefore a little bit, uh, it's easy for people in Brisbane to be complacent about that greenness. Um, yet it's this tree cover on private property that uh, we know because of the changing types of development uh, that we're losing at a rapid rate. Um, and uh, Tony Hall will talk a little bit more about this, uh, but um, because most people uh, Brisbane is a very rapidly urbanising area. Most people will be living in smaller lot detached dwellings or multi-unit dwellings. Um, that, that is causing our tree cover on private property be, to be decreased. And I, I think the point about that is that that makes our public realm our trees, in, including our streetscapes, to be even more important in, in the future. Uh, but I've got a few figures um, about the, the losses of tree cover on private property. Um, in the last 20 years, and, and they're quite frightening. So these are, these are measures that we took using the tree cover analysis from 2010, um, and uh, they look at the effects of both development time as well as development type um, on tree cover on private property. Uh, and you can see that it's the, you know, since the 1990s that that era of development, we've got this huge change in tree cover on private property. And what's even more scary is that we've got in the different types of residential uh, development, multi-unit dwellings is killing um, off private tree cover. So making the leafy streets agenda even more important. I just must be hitting that a little bit differently. But do our streetscapes have the capacity to offset some of this loss that's going on on private property? Um, well, the answer is certainly not unless we reconfigure the street environment, especially in those areas that are subject to the smaller lot or more intense um, detached dwelling environment. And you can, you can see why. In this um, red box here, We've got some small lot development here. And what can we see? Lots and lots and lots of driveways and no room for street trees. So driveways are, are taking over in that style of development. But in multi-unit dwelling areas, 
um, without, with less driveways, I suppose, per, per, um, per dwelling unit. We've got the potential for improving tree cover on streets. Uh, in fact, you know, this blurry image on the left-hand side is you know, obviously from a brochure you know, for, of a multi-unit dwelling. Um, they're claiming they can put some lots of trees and vegetation on the, on the street frontage. Oh, they can even put them on the roof as well. Yep. But um, the reality is, and, and I live in a higher density area, that um, we, can, we can get some decent shade cover and tree cover in streets in those areas. Um, but let's hope so. Let's hope that we can continue to do that in high growth areas because you know, those areas that are being targeted for infill development and higher density development are in already some of literally the hotspot areas of Brisbane. This is a map that shows um, re road reserve tree cover, in other words, sort of um, footpath tree cover or, or street tree cover uh, across the 200 odd suburbs in Brisbane. And the, one, the suburbs that are in red and orange in particular have least amounts of <coughs> tree cover existing in the road reserve in 2010. Um, and some of those suburbs are the ones that are targeted for high growth. So it's starting off in not a good place and it will require some serious investment to get that right in future. We're talking about suburbs like um, the, the northern corridor. Um, these are suburbs that are uh, like, I suppose, Lutwich, Albion, through to Chermside. Is anyone familiar with some of those suburbs in Brisbane? Along the Lutwich Road corridor, where we've just installed you know, yet greater you know, beautiful bus stations and things like that. So we're wanting people to actually be walking to a train station or a bus station in those high growth areas. Um, so we better get it right in terms of uh, streetscape. We also know a fair bit about our um, street tree resource already in, in Brisbane. Um, same kinds of uh, analyses that, that have been done. We, we like to, to build the evidence for, for that sort of um, management. Uh, we know that there are around 575,000 street trees um, across no less than about 4,800 kilometres of streets in Brisbane. Um, and that, that is delivering around an average of 35% shade cover for those footpaths. So about a third of your journey on average will be shaded by trees. There's room for about 120,000 more street trees. Um, they comprise no less than 200 different species, um, but about 30 species make up 70% of the population. They didn't get there by accident, nor is their future guaranteed, given that they're on the front line. Um, and BCC spends on average around 10 times more on street trees than we do on park trees. So they're that expensive element. We also know from um, using software tools like iTree. Has anyone heard of iTree? Yep, good. Uh, iTree helps people at any, at any scale. It's a free access software um, to learn a little bit more about um, the structure of, the, of their tree cover, as well as some of the environmental benefits. So we know that our street trees are offering some air quality, rainfall interception, carbon storage and sequestration benefits to the value of about $1.67 million a year. So uh, that's not to be sneezed at. So it's this measuring and monetizing ecosystem services of, of urban forests that is, is critically important. And this kind of ecological accounting using software tools like iTree has a very important part to play in building awareness and identifying opportunities for, um, for investment and making that stronger business case. And uh, th these are, uh, this is an image here from um, Chicago. Uh, after doing it, their analysis using iTree streets or probably stratum at that stage, uh, they were able to uh, tell people in uh, Chicago streets on Arbor Day in 2011, you know, just what kinds of, of monetary benefits in, in, in terms of environmental values were being returned for the sorts of investment that the city via Mayor Richard M. Daly were, were making. <clears throat> 
And this chart over here, or diagram over here, is a, is a typical sort of iTree streets output um, from the US version of, of iTree streets. And um, a large portion, a very large portion of their outputs are, are property value benefits. And property value benefits in those sorts of equations for making business cases about street trees have, have tended to be this larger component of the US analyses. And it's a component that's not available in iTree Eco here in um, Australia yet. Um, so that was part of the motivation for my um, research as well. So these are an important component, but a bit of a gap in our knowledge here. So my study um, is uh, a hedonic price model. Uh, that's a, that's a, a fancy name for a, um, a multiple regression analysis. It unpacks the shopping trolley of attributes um, that affect how sales price. It's a, what's called a revealed preference method. So it's revealing what people, um, what attributes people are prepared to pay for when they're purchasing houses. So it's almost like you know, their, their shopping trolley of factors that they're um, revealing through the house sale price and that I can unpack um, to, to learn a little bit more about, you know, are, are trees actually playing a, a part in that shopping trolley? So I looked at um, 2,299 house sales between the years of two, 2008 and 2010 across 80 sample areas of Brisbane. Uh, there are many more house sales that occur you know, during that time uh, annually across Brisbane, but I looked at 80 sample sites. Um, I looked at just single dwelling houses. So this is a you know this narrowed the study just to those sorts of uh, development. I wasn't looking at multi-unit dwellings. Um, or other um, small lot uh, development. I was just looking at single uh, detached uh, dwelling house sales. I looked at 21 different attributes um, of those uh, house sales. Um, they were house attributes, there were property attributes, there were tree attributes as well as suburb attributes. Unpacking that shopping trolley. And of the tree cover um, attributes, so I was looking at tree cover on the property, tree cover um, near the property, uh, a tree cover in the nearest park, tree cover on the front footpath and tree cover on the footpaths near uh, the, the property. And how we did that for each of the sample sites um, or sample areas is that if the little orange area here is the house sale itself, um, then uh, we looked at, uh, pulled out that percentage tree cover either within the orange polygon or within the buffer area which was nearby the house um, or along the footpath um, as well. Uh, so the, it was using that sort of same satellite imagery and things like that to measure tree cover within those polygons as part of those attributes. So of those 21 attributes, which ones were significant? Which ones were having a significant effect on house sale prices? Well, the ones in orange here of those 21 are the ones that were having a significant effect. And which ones, which one do you think would have the greatest effect on house sale price? It's not a tree cover attribute, it's, uh, so, did someone say bathrooms? Bathrooms, number of bathrooms wins, yep. Uh, we're ob obsessed with our bathrooms in Australia um, and, and they have a, have a great effect. Uh, also, uh, of course, the age of suburb has a significant effect on house sale price as well. The model explained um, around 65.9% of the variance. That means that it's a modestly robust model. Um, there were other attributes, obviously, contributing to house sale price uh, that were missing um, from the study. Uh, so things like perhaps the age of the house itself rather than just the age of the suburb in which the house was sold. Um, perhaps other things um, like the, uh, the, the types of schools that are nearby, um, things like that for which data is not as readily available. Um, so these hedonic price models always have limitations. Okay, so what, of the two tree cover variables, that were found to have some significance. It was not tree cover on the front footpath, 
uh, and it wasn't tree cover nearby, it was the tree cover on the fo footpaths nearby um, was significant and had a positive effect. So it's the leafy street factor that was positive. So the more tree cover on the footpath nearby, not necessarily on the front footpath, um, the higher the house sale price. Unfortunately, uh, initially on the initial run in my model, um, the more tree cover that was on the property, the lower the house sale price. A bit of a scary thought. However, when I broke up that tree cover on the property into increments, I found that there was a threshold. 20% uh, tree cover on the property, less than 20% tree cover on the property, the equation flipped around to being positive. Now, I think this says something very much about the, the amount of space that's left on the private property in, in which to grow trees, uh, but something also about home buyers' attitude to trees on private property. And that is, you know, they're, they're perceived somewhat as a bit of a maintenance burden, as a, as a bit of a nuisance, as a bit of an expense. And also, the other interesting thing is that there was no significant effect of tree cover on the front footpath. Um, so it was more the leafiness in the streets. So it's sort of saying, you know, yeah, I love street trees, but, you know, as long as my neighbour has them. Now, in spite of, you know, local government being responsible for looking after, you know, the street trees, I think people do still perceive the street tree on their footpath somewhat also as a little bit of a nuisance, a little bit of a, you know, a maintenance burden, even though they're not directly looking after it. So there's, there's an indifference to the street tree on the footpath, but there's a love of the leafy street. So when we translate this using the hedonic price model equation um, to, well, what does that mean in terms of property value benefits of leafy streets in Brisbane? At the current level of 35% uh, footpath tree cover that I mentioned before, um, it adds around, you know, just 0.35% to, to median house sale price. You know, that, can, that is around $1,871 um, compared to, you know, of that median house sale price. That's a, that's a small kind of effect. Um, and the bit that you can't see there because it's in the, in the white picket fence is that when we get up around that 50% tree cover in the leafy streets that we're aiming for in terms of providing people with that more shady, comfortable environment, um, that's when, you know, we really start to make the difference and we're up around 5% um, improvement on, on house sale price. Um, and $29,000. But just being conservative and looking at, well, what is that 35% footpath tree cover delivering to councils and other beneficiaries um, today, rather than the 50%, let's look at the 35%, you know, just conservatively. It's delivering $29.5 million worth of benefits, um, predominantly to um, home buyers, obviously, or, or home sellers, I guess, or homeowners, um, compared to the $13 million of costs annually. So it, for every dollar that council is spending, there's a $2.27 return in property value benefits alone. There's also a, a benefit that comes back directly to councils through the rating system and the relationship between property values and um, rates and that is around $1 million. So that's an 8% um, almost direct return um, to councils. And there's also about a $1.23 million a year uh, return to the state government that comes from stamp duty taxes um, for which they've not invested one red cent. So just to wrap this up, then you know, we've, we've got street trees paying their way in property value benefits alone. We've got street trees out the front making no difference, which is a very important tool for, you know, how do we engage better with property owners? The leafy streets factor making a difference. You know, small but marginal effects, but making a big difference to that cost-benefit equation. Now, I think the most important point of all is that you know, this kind of economic case is helping to justify ongoing investments in leafy streets. In the, in the projects like neighbourhood shadeways that are trying to get more um, trees into those shade hungry hot spots so that around the walk to school areas, the ride to school areas, uh, the walk to shops, 
those kinds of things where we could really make a difference to the cooling and comfort and greenness of those suburbs. So it's this sort of you know, effort in business cases and, and, and economic evidence that we hope that would not only justify ongoing investments by local government authorities, or, but also perhaps attract some uh, alternative sources of investment. And just leave you with um, one uh, other image of uh, an alternative investment that occurred in street trees a long time ago. And it just makes us think outside the square in terms of who perhaps those alternative investors could be, um, rather than having the burden entirely on local government. And that is... Was here. here it is. Okay, <laughs> this was in um, 1909. The Norman B Hotel, which is this building here, um, donated 10 pounds uh, to the Ithaca Town Council at the time uh, to help with their shade tree planting along Kelvin Grove Road. And here's one of those fabulous figs. 20 years later, this is photo was taken in 1929, and here's some of those trees. You know, 100 years later. Uh, making it an iconic entrance statement um, to Brisbane. So alternative investors, as well as justifying ongoing investments by local government authorities, is absolutely critical to the future of our leafy streetscapes. Thank you.